planned, you know, a planned bankruptcy. Uh, let, let's go out of business. And, and the question that we need to ask, uh, the question that the world needs to ask right now, is where are these companies going once that they got insolvent? Where are the people, the CEOs and the companies and the corporate reps, where are those people going? Or did they go home? Did they turn their suit and tie in? Uh, did they cash out all their, their accounts and put it into the, to the company that they ran into the ground? Or did they simply start another company over in another state and say, okay, look, we now have this, this uh, new company and we're now doing this again? Forcing on the state of Florida a situation where you have citizens who now has over a million policies. But they're a quasi-government entity, and when you start to sue them, there's some different things that happen. So the insurance companies realize more protection under those policies than they did under the policies that they actually sold. Mm. So are they becoming insolvent to force a crisis that doesn't exist, a crisis that you created so that you could then force mass exodus into state-run facility? Where do you think we got FEMA at? Where do you think we have all, where do you think citizens came from in the first place? Insurance companies pulling out. You know, they, they come out and they threaten the, the Department of Insurance and, and the state, hey, we're going to pull out. Please pull out. Please pull out, but here's the promise. You don't get to ever come back. If you pull out of this state, if you, if when something happens bad and, and that's what you're here for, is when those bad things happen, that's why you're taking the premiums, that's the promise that you made. If you're going to pull out when it's time to, to, to honor your promise and leave the state and the citizens of the state to be left with uh, any type of situation that was not what they paid, so Kyle, you yes, should be banned you've from You've done this coming back plenty of times, man. You, you are an expert at coming out and helping people. You told me, and this is my first time being this close to uh, an event date or a catastrophe. You told me to post up 30 miles away from um, where your ground zero is going to be. What's the reason for that? Um, I've never had the ability, as many times as we've done this, uh, we're getting better at the social media, but we're not good yet. And, and we're not, you know, um, we're trying to get to a point where we're at today. That's why you're here. Mm -hmm. so that we can document the incoming of what we see when we first go in. Uh, the insurance companies do multiple things uh, when it, things first happen. Uh, and number one, what they do is I call put makeup on the pig. Mm -hmm. They try to get Main Street cleaned up and they try to get what everybody sees with the physical eye cleaned up. They try to pay those claims quickly. Uh, they try to get reconstruction going in those areas faster than anything that you've ever seen. But they do it for a reason they begin to shift out adjusters. You'll see the first set will come in 30 days, they'll be shift out, 30 days there'll be another shift out. By the time that we hit the third or fourth month and they've waited, they, they, if they mess around, they can have a whole lot of time here. Um, and especially if the insurer doesn't perform, what ends up happening is by the time that fourth round of adjusters gets out here, they didn't see what we saw. They didn't come into town with everything just completely demolished, houses sitting in the middle of the road. The house is completely gone everywhere that you look, roofs ripped off, uh, people's belongings laying in the middle of the street, dolls, things that you just tear your heart apart. They didn't see any of that. What they see now is makeup on the pig and they think, well, this is not that bad. And then that becomes the theory of the claim when you submit your claim to the insurance company and you finally get to them to come out and do what they're supposed to do, especially if you don't have a, you know, a legal representative that knows what they're doing. By the time that that happens, that person has no idea how bad things were. Mm -hmm. And they're being told by their supervisors, hey, it wasn't that bad. And that becomes the absolute uh, myth is that things weren't that bad. So what we're trying to do is get in here and document it in the, in the front of this so that people understand that it was that bad. Um, and then there's a second part of that. Uh, insurance companies are fleeing from uh, from Florida and, and droves. Mm -hmm. uh, the sixth one they just announced was insolvency. Uh, there's only really a few ways, and I'm sure that you could find multiple ways if you were trying to look for anomalies, but specific reasons. There's really two specific reasons that an insurance company would become insolvent. Number one was outright mismanagement. They just didn't do it. And that doesn't have anything with insurance or the attorneys filing lawsuits to try to protect the insurance doesn't mean that there's not attorneys and PAs that aren't doing the right thing out there, that are they're doing criminal activities. That, of course that's going to happen. 
same as it is on the carrier side, same as it is in the police department, same as it is inside of any corporate structure. Somebody in there is a criminal and they're breaking the law. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they have a title of a public adjuster or attorney, that, that's, a, that's a condition of who they are. But they were a criminal before they started all of that. So um, that being said, the second one would be um, planned, you know, a planned bankruptcy. Uh, let, let's go out of business. And, and the question that we need to ask, uh, the question that the world needs to ask right now, is where are these companies going once that they got insolvent? Mm -hmm. Where are the people, the CEOs and the companies and the corporate reps, where are those people going? Or did they go home? Did they turn their suit and tie in? Uh, did they cash out all their, their accounts and put it into the, to the company that they ran into the ground? Or did they simply start another company over in another state and say, okay, look, we now have this, this uh, new company and we're now doing this again? Forcing on the state of Florida a situation where you have citizens who now has over a million policies. But they're a quasi-government entity, and when you start to sue them, there's some different things that happen. So the insurance companies realize more protection under those policies than they did under the policies that they actually sold. Mm. So are they becoming insolvent to force a crisis that doesn't exist, a crisis that you created so that you could then force mass exodus into state-run facility? Where do you think we got FEMA at? Where do you think we have all, where do you think citizens came from in the first place? Insurance companies pulling out. You know, they, they come out and they threaten the, the Department of Insurance and, and the state, hey, we're going to pull out. Please pull out. Please pull out, but here's the promise. You don't get to ever come back. If you pull out of this state, if, you, if when something happens bad and, and that's what you're here for, is when those bad things happen, that's why you're taking the premiums, that's the promise that you made. If you're going to pull out when it's time to, to, to honor your promise and leave the state and the citizens of the state to be left with uh, any type of situation that was not what they paid, you should be banned from ever coming back here again. But they're not. They leave and then they come back later after they've forced some kind of horrific legislation on AOB or on 10 days. Think mm -hmm. about 10 days for a insured to sign a contract with the public insurance adjuster that they have to wait for the rescission period. Mm -hmm. To me, that's unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. What other industries besides the mitigation industry have to wait longer than 72 hours? How much does the banks make you wait? How much is everything that you have a rescission period for set at? 72 hours. Why are we being treated differently, and why must the insured wait 10 days before they begin to perform? They don't know how to perform under the contract. It's their duty to perform under the contract. By that law, by that statute, they're requiring that the insured, before they can hire somebody who's a legal representative, the legal representative is smart, is not going to touch the claim for 10 days because that's what the law says. If you begin to work before this, then you have a problem. They can cancel the contract at any point in time. Mm -hmm. Then how do you quantify that work? Mm -hmm. It's very hard, even at $500 an hour, because the majority of the work should be done in that first 10 days. Mm -hmm. Why? That's the insurance duty. Promptly. Mm -hmm. Promptly follow the duties after a loss. Not, you know, after 10 days, not whenever. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on that I want to, I want to look into. Policyholders Preservation Association of America is not just Texas, not just Chicago. It's here in Florida, too. Uh, I'm a policyholder. I have been a policyholder for a long time. I will be a policyholder for the rest of my life on multiple levels. This bus we're in, got a policy on it. The house, the business, everything has a policy on it. You have policies. We are all policyholders. If we don't do something now, they're going to change the climate where we are never going to be able to recover when a catastrophic event happens. And unfortunately, they would prefer that. If you want to fight Mike Tyson, when do you fight Mike Tyson? When he's at his most prime? or when he's at his most weakest. Mm -hmm. If you have a choice, you don't have a choice to fight him or not, but you have a choice when you could fight him in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Do you pick him when it is his strongest or when he's at his weakest? Oh yeah, when he's yeah. at his weakest. There's things that can be done to make sure that you're at your weakest. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in these catastrophes. Mm -hmm. They make sure that the insured cannot fight back. Mm -hmm. You're a very easy victim when you cannot fight back. Mm -hmm. When you don't have enough money, when your deductibles are so high that you can't pay the deductible. I got news for you, that's, that's not correct. 
uh, and I want anybody that sees this video, if you're an insured that lives anywhere in this area or is struck by a catastrophic event, you need to sit down right away and you need to log exactly what you did the second that Governor DeSantis said, hey, you need to do something different here because this storm is coming. Uh, anything that you did to the house, putting your, your furniture up on the outside, strapping stuff down, uh, sandbagging, all of those things were done in pursuit of mitigating your property. Because of your contract, it requires that you mitigate. That means before, if you know something is coming, you have a duty to try to protect the, the property. That protects you and the insurance company, and it also follows the contract. Mm -hmm. So once you do that, you need to write all that down. If it was you and your buddy and four of your friends, if it was you and your husband or wife and y'all, your three kids and y'all all did all of this, how many hours did you do it because they're required to pay for that? Mm -hmm. That would be money that would come immediately towards that deductible. So it could add up really quickly. That doesn't mean go generate hours, and I want to be very clear about that. Don't generate anything. Uh, you do what you're supposed to do under the policy, uh, and everything will take its place as long as you have somebody look at that policy and go over it. Unfortunately, your policy requires that you do do that, and the insurance company, the people that owe you, it's not a good idea to ask them how much. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely not a good idea, and the policy doesn't say that you should do that. That's why the 10-day rule is such a smack in the face. It says that you've got to perform. And if you can't perform and you have to hire somebody, you must wait 10 days before that person can actually perform mm -hmm. or they don't really know what they're doing. And you mm -hmm. probably don't need to hire those people anyway. And those are some great tips. Uh, I've heard of companies filing bankruptcy and getting the opportunity to uh, avoid pa paying their, their creditors, uh, liquidate their, 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 their equipment and furniture. And then when you look at the paperwork to who they liquidated the furniture and equipment their own, to their own company, yeah, it sounds like you're saying this is uh, this is insolvency by name only. Yes, yeah, with with the very deceitful design behind it mm -hmm. to force the the insured public into a lesser product. That way, you have less recourse when the insurance companies do what they like to do and simply tell you, no, we're not paying your claim. I don't care how legit it is. I don't care how bad that hurricane was. Uh, we're going to give you $20,000 for 500000 worth of damages, and you're going to like it or, 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 you know, you just go jump in the river. Mm. That shouldn't happen that way. That's not what we paid for. Not what I paid for, not what you paid for, not what anybody who's been affected by this storm has been paid for. Mm. So we're going to come in and, and make sure that uh, that there's two sides of the story told. Mm -hmm. If you want to tell a story, let's make sure that we at least have this side of it told and we have it told in a way uh, of somebody that understands what it is that we're looking at. And yeah. I think the industry would agree that I'm one of those people. Yeah. Uh, that when we look at something, we understand you know, mechanically what happened to get us to where we're at today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're about to stop that erosion of the rights. Now, what, what made you choose... On. What made you choose the American Legion to set up? I, uh, veterans have a... I got in trouble when I was a kid, so when I tried to get into the military, I could not. Uh, it's bothered me in my entire life that I was not able to serve. Uh, it was my own fault. I have nobody to blame for it. There's no sob story. Uh, I was an idiot kid, made some mistakes, uh, and because of that, I couldn't. But since I didn't, I've tried to give back uh, in every single way that I could to the veterans. They have a special place in my heart. You know, uh, we do the, the veterans program where we put a veteran through, sometimes two, sometimes five, uh, camp every single month on us. We, we pay for the ticket and we pay for their uh, room. And if they need cash for food, we give them 250 for the food. The only deal is, is that you be a veteran um, and that you get here. Uh, I want them to struggle just a second to get there. They wouldn't, and I can't pay for the whole thing. We pay for the whole thing. We find out that they don't appreciate it very well. Mm -hmm. I need there to be something on their part of it that is uh, a given. Uh, so naturally, we try to reach out to areas like uh, VFW uh, or American Legion, and then uh, what we'll more than likely do is once I speak, you know, get over there and figure out what's going on, uh, we will more than likely set up a fund. We don't really take donations. If, if a company would say, hey, we want to buy the meat for today, then we would absolutely let them do that and put their name out there and say, hey, thank you for doing this. But we don't take really like cash. We don't really want cash. But people, what we found is that we didn't care what we want. People want to give money. They're, they're just straight up here. We need to pay you. No, pay it to the, the American Legion. Uh, they can set up a fund right here, pay it to them, 
and then we'll pick veterans out of that that meet a criteria uh, that maybe didn't have insurance, they were underinsured or whatever, and we can get them to take that money and make sure that we have veterans that are uh, being taken care of. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they put their, I don't care whether they served, I don't care what they did. Uh, what happened is, is they signed a check mm -hmm. that said, in case you want my life, you can have it. Uh, I think for that single act, no matter what happened after that, unless you got a dishonorable discharge, uh, you were willing to put your life on the line for my freedom, and I, I believe that means something. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the that's the gist of where we're at and where we're going now. Got it. And I think the, uh, it's it's post one ten. Uh, if anybody wanted uh, to receive blessings from your your donations or contribute themselves. How should they get there? Um, well, I, it, and again, we're in the, the we're, we're at ground zero uh -huh. right after it happened. Uh, I'm going to speak with with the with the the bosses over there and see what they want to do. I mm -hmm. don't want to force anything on anybody. I want them to give me an idea of what they want. If they want me to guide them, I will absolutely do that. Um, as soon as we have that, then we'll post a separate little post with that specifically on how they should do that. But I don't want any part of it. I simply want to be the intermediary to get the two connected, and then I want out. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and then the American Legion can be involved with uh, how the funds are dispersed. Now, again, I'll give them guidance if they want, uh, but that's totally up to them. And you told me uh, earlier today that it took a year and a half for you to decide that this is the best way for you to enter. What made you make that decision? Well my whole life. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I'm fixing to be 50 in a couple of months. And, uh, you know, I've done this many, many times. And uh, uh, we later, we were ready that the, the reason that we're here right now so early and so ready, and we're, we're going to feed thousands and thousands yeah. of people in the next couple of days um, alone, and maybe more than that, we, we can feed more than that if necessary. Um, but, it, but it's come with, with such, uh, we've been in these trenches for a long time. As a builder first uh, and foremost, and I understand that as well as any of them today and the struggle that they're having, part of the reason that we're here. Um, and then as an insured, I've been the insured that's been on the other end of this thing as well, multiple times on, on uh, hurricane claims, automobile claims, every kind of claim that you could think of, I've been, I've been on the other side as well. Um, and, and we understand what's going on, what they need and what they don't need. What they don't need is somebody going down there going, hey, you got work for me, you got work for me, you got work for me. Those conversations will be had. There's mm -hmm. time for those conversations. Uh, what we're going to talk about right now is fulfilling the immediate need, which is going to be to feed people a hot meal. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the best way to do it, is to come in and to make certain that you don't come in with your hand out, that you absolutely come in 100% self-sufficient. That's why this bus is here. Mm -hmm. It's 100% self-sufficient. As long as I have diesel and water, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I, I can last for a whole long time, and I don't have to get anything from you means I don't have to take your housing. You've already been displaced. Now you can't find somewhere because I've taken your housing. Mm -hmm. How much help is that? A lot. Yeah. Well, how much help is it if I take your stuff away? Oh, not help at all. Yeah, it, it's harming the very people I came here to help. So mm -hmm. we need when we come down here and do these things, we need to keep those things in mind. Uh, and I understand everybody's limited. Uh, I, I, again, the first time that I came to Florida back in 2004, uh, I had a, a half-ton pickup. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a 16-foot trailer. And I had a bunch of tools and just a little bit of money. <laughs> if anything bad would have happened, I wouldn't have made it. Uh, you know, it would have been horrible. But I had will and I had determination, which a lot of these people will have. I hope they just simply take heed and get in with somebody that's established. That doesn't mean go get in bed with somebody that they may harm you. Uh, but you, the, the licensure out here is very stiff, and they're on it. Uh, they've got some of the best building codes in the world. Uh, they've got some of the best laws in the world. Uh, but when you come out here and you don't follow those laws to a T, they'll put you in prison really, really quickly here. Mm -hmm. um, and coming to help somebody out turns out with you with a prison sentence because uh, you either told somebody that you could do something that you legally couldn't or uh, you took on more than you can chew and mm -hmm. you can't get it paid because the insurance companies are not in business to pay money. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Uh, and they'll make everybody suffer. The contractors, the insureds, it doesn't matter who it is, they will make them suffer. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's for them to keep more, you know, cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if you can keep more cash by just telling somebody no, you know, that's pretty intoxicating, isn't it? You owe yeah. me a bunch of money. Well, you know, I think I think I like keeping that money in my pocket. I just, I don't think I'm going to pay you. Mm -hmm. And what's your recourse? I don't know. Right, everybody stands around <laughs> looking like, what do I do? 
well, you, you hire a public adjuster, but you don't need to wait till the bad thing happens. Mm -hmm. You need to go ahead and hire them first because that's what your policy says. Your policy says that you, the insured, must perform. It doesn't say that the insurance company is supposed to send their person out so that they can perform for you. That's, that's a, a conflict of interest. It's a complete, if you were to see conflict of interest definition inside of the dictionary and it had a picture beside it, it would be that relationship of the insurance company sending their own guy with their checkbook to tell you if they owe you any money and if they actually do think they owe you money, how much that would be, mm -hmm. knowing that money is coming out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. See, once you pay your premium, it's no longer your money. Yeah, It's their money until that contract kicks in. Mm -hmm. The contract does not kick in until the insured performs those duties after a loss. Again, while that 10-day rule is such a bunch of crap, yeah, you are literally forcing them to wait 10 days. It could prejudice everything by you forcing them to do that. But I believe that we as an industry haven't attacked these laws in that way. We've went another route for different reasons, and some of them not so pure, uh, about how to go about getting some of these things undone that have been done. But the reality is, is it, tell me one question. Whose duty is it to prove the loss after after the loss occurs? Is it the insurance, com the insurance company's duty to prove that for the insured? Or is it the insured's duty to prove that to the insurance company? Mm. If it's the insured's duty, then how in the world can the insurance company do that? Mm. Mm. It means that they get to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. It means that if they control the narrative, what happens? It changes the end of the whatever, story. Whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am controlling the narrative, so whatever's going to happen, you know, you're, I know your roof costs $25,000. Here's seven, and you got a $5,000 deductible, and you got $1,800 worth of depreciation. Here's $200. Better luck for you next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's what we see, correct? Yeah. We see just that time and time and time again. People call me and go, well, my paperwork, I, let me guess. You got a $5,000 deductible, uh, they paid you $7,000, and, and they took the deductible, and they took all $1,800 in, in depreciation. How did you know? Because it's not an anomaly. You're not, you're not, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you're not special. <laughs> They're doing it to everybody. They, they, if you ever want to see what truly unprejudiced looks like, look at an insurance company. They don't care if you're a senator, a judge, mm -hmm. <laughs> their own agents, their own CEOs. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't. It doesn't matter who you are. You get exactly the same treatment. Mm. Mm. And mm. that's what, how you get along, right there. Yeah. Huh? yeah. That's a baby. You want to know how you get along? That's how mm -hmm. you do it. Everybody gets treated <laughs> yeah, the same. Absolutely. Yes. And, and and one thing that I think somebody might say, a pessimist might say, mm -hmm. is Cal is only giving because he knows he's gonna get something in return. And, and and what I'll say to that is, yesterday I called you because I knew I was coming down here to meet you. <laughs> and I said, hey, somebody said they might have uh, some something for you. And you ain't even, you cut me off and said, you ain't wanna talk about it. You only thinking about giving. Yeah, that, that claims, again, there's a time and a place for it. Anybody that would say, I'm gonna expect something in return, yes, I'm going to do a lot of business. There's no question about that, and there should be no question. I'm a for-profit business, but I could take my money and give it to advertisers who would give it to somebody else, or I can come in and do what I love, and I can feed. And when I come in and do what I love, and when I feed, I'm doing what I love, I'm doing good for the community, and we will talk about your claims later. Today, if you notice all of our vehicles, the only markings that you see of insurancebusters.net are our shirts. None of the vehicles are wrapped out, nothing. There's no banners, there's no signs saying, hey, come get free claim help. Hey, you need to get bring your paperwork to eat. There's not a, I don't care who you are, adjuster, their attorneys, uh, their engineers, anybody, if you're hungry, come eat. This is a joint effort. We're all going to try to work together. Uh, I, I don't want my post to sound too negative because it's not negative. I'm simply stating facts. This is what historically goes on. I've done it my uh, nearly my entire adult life. I know what the cycle is going to happen and that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're going to come in and feed uh, and then in a couple of days when we kind of get everybody power back and everybody's kind of got their stuff together, we're going to continue to feed like we always have. When all the cameras are gone and all the media has left and all of the good juicy stories are over with, we'll still be here and we'll still be feeding, just like we have in Louisiana, Mississippi, and we don't typically go. We went to, it's funny, and I'll just give a little story and we'll get off here. Um, 
when we went to Mississippi, and we go to Mississippi all the time because that's where Melanie was is from, and they have a lot of tornadoes. Uh, we hit the the tornadoes in Hattiesburg for the second time, and we set up right downtown, um, and probably one of the worst areas in in Hattiesburg. And we had within minutes ten cop cars, the National Guard. Hey, y'all know where y'all are at? We know exactly where we're at. Mm -hmm. If y'all set up here, there's going to be problems. Why is there going to be problems? Well, you're in the wrong neighborhood. No, sir. The people over on the other side of town, they had enough money to get out. Mm -hmm. They don't need mm -hmm. Fed on the other side of town. The people here didn't have enough money to get out of town. They didn't have the wherewithal. They didn't have the means. And they were stuck, and they're still stuck, right here with their homes laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. No, we're right where we need to be. And it was amazing because the second they figured that out, they brought the utility company out, put us up temporary mm -hmm. lights. The guard came out, set guard on the back side of the deal. And we stayed there for about two weeks uh, feeding right there. And then we moved to another to a church location where we could do like we're going to do at the American mm -hmm. Legion. No matter where we set up, we're going to bring people to you. Mm -hmm. And it means that if you were struggling before, if there were some things going on before, uh, I believe our involvement in your life is going to change that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to make it better before we walk out of there. You were the change that you seeked. Yes.